Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Winning Drop Podcast. I am Rita Hubbard, the NFL chick, co-host of the Glenn and Rita Show on 105.7 The Fan with my guy Cordell Woodland from the Shaking It Up Sports and the Ravens reporter for 105.7 The Fan. And Cordell, we witnessed a beatdown yesterday, something very similar to the Detroit Lions a couple of weeks ago. But the Ravens come in. Uh, well, the Ravens are at home. They don't come in anyway. They're they're where they are. <laughs> and the Seattle Seahawks come in and completely get dominated by the Ravens as they defeat the Seahawks 37 to three. And you and I, you know, talked about this. I, I, I think we both definitely thought that this would be a much closer game than what it ended up being. Uh, but ironically, it was just. I didn't expect this. I mean, but also didn't expect Detroit. I think we both would. I think at one point you had went back and forth about the Detroit game on how that went down um, and eventually picked them. But I think we, you know, thought that it would be a more competitive game. And then, you know, Detroit gets shellacked. A couple weeks later, Seattle comes in. This is a very good football team. Um, and while you and I, I think, were more soundly in picking the Ravens because they have played really good football lately, I don't think we saw this happen. Like in a million years, I didn't think three points that you were going to hold Seattle uh, during this game with the the wide receiving core that they have. Yeah, I mean, definitely didn't expect the Ravens to hold them to three. Um, I think I said 24-13 last week in terms of prediction. I, I thought the Ravens would handle their business. I said all week the one the, the, the one thing that I thought that the Ravens had clearly had the advantage in was their defense against Seattle's offense. And that's mm-hmm. exactly what ended up happening. Geno Smith, who had not been playing well coming into the game, had arguably his worst game of the season in the loss against the Ravens. Looked confused, looked lost, looked like he had no idea what he was looking at on the field out there. The Ravens did such a great job of not only confusing him, but I also think the offensive coordinator, it looked like the offensive coordinator didn't know what to call, what to do to get that offense on track. I mean, that's a big play offense. And the Ravens defense has been so good at not allowing the big play this year. So I just had to put two and two together and figured that it would be a tough day for Seattle's offense. Now, where I thought the game would end up being somewhat close is I thought the Ravens offense would struggle a little bit against Seattle's defense. And at the beginning of the game, that was kind of the case. Um, yeah. but once the Ravens got going. I mean, it was just hard to stop them. And Keaton Mitchell just really turned out to have a coming out party and everybody had been waiting for him to get an opportunity. He clearly gives this team something that they don't have. Uh, you put that, type of speed in the backfield with Lamar. There's nobody else that can replicate that on this team, not Justice Hill. Gus Edwards can't. See, and what I like about Keaton Mitchell is I feel like he's a combination of both of those guys. I think he's has the, he's. I think he's faster than Justice Hill, uh, has that quickness and elusiveness, but he also runs strong. He obviously isn't the brute that Gus Edwards is, but you're not bringing Keaton Mitchell down with arm tackles. We saw that. On Sunday, he's running through arm tackles. He's running through anybody that thinks that they're just going to grab him and take him down. He, I mean, he was running like he really had something to prove. And for him to go out there and have the game that he did, I mean, that 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 truly was a big time. And if he can continue, you know, it's it's tough to keep up nine carries for 138 yards and a touchdown, 15 yards a pop. Um, But if he can show himself to a stay healthy. Because that's the number one thing, I think, with Keaton Mitchell. Even in the game, he got nicked up a little bit. I saw him go over to the bike, uh, and then it looked like he came back in. Not exactly sure if he got another carry after he got hurt. But um, health is his only issue. It's the whole reason that we've had to wait this long to even see him on the field. Um, but I, I just thought if he can if he can stay healthy and really they can, can submit him as a true part of this offense, I think that is a whole nother layer um, for this Ravens offense that, that could really open things up for them. I thought the offensive line played well for the most part, obviously not a usual Ronnie Stanley year for Ronnie Stanley, Ronnie Stanley yeah. struggling a little bit uh, case in point, the strip sack on Lamar. And that wasn't mm-hmm. the only time he got beat um, mm-hmm. in that game. So he, he's the one that's kind of worrying me a little bit, especially with Morgan Moses out. 
right now. You really need Ronnie to kind of be the guy on that left side. Odell gets his touchdown on his birthday. No real surprise there. I guess the real surprise is that it was Tyler Huntley throwing him the ball and not Lamar <laughs> getting him his first touchdown catch. But good to see Odell um, get that because, you know, he, he needed that. I, I think he yeah. needed that for, him, for himself. And um, the Ravens, I'm sure, are happy that he got it because now they don't have to worry about an upset Odell. Um, because he wasn't as involved as he wanted to be. Mark Andrews, third down monster. Um, again, I, I, it's just a complete game for the guys. I had talked to Brandon Stevens after the game, and he called that the most complimentary game that they have played as a team uh, to this point in the season, and I, I'd have to agree. Um, I, I want to go back to a couple of things that you hit on. First of all, um, a lot of us have – been waiting for this moment for Keith Mitchell. I know Keith Mitchell obviously probably was waiting for this moment more than anybody, mm -hmm. but a lot of fan base and media have been waiting for this moment because um, of the potential that we saw from him in training camp as well as preseason. And, and it is really good to see him finally getting some touches. Um, you know, I, I'm with you that he is shiftier than Justice Hill. Um, he is faster and stronger. I'm not going to compare him to J.K. Dobbins, but but what I will say is I think that this I think that he can give them what the Ravens were expecting uh -huh. from J.K. Dobbins while he is out. I think that he is a good complimentary, a very good complimentary back to Gus Edwards. Um, I don't think that that necessarily means that G, uh, Gino Justice is going to have less. Well, he's going to get less touches because I think Keaton is going, he has earned the right to get more. And the situation with Justice Hill and Lamar, when it, when they, uh, with the RPO situation, that's, and the fumble, I mean, that's the it, problem. Just, it just got to stop. It got, well, yeah. first and foremost, if I'm talking, Todd Munkin just got to stop doing that with Justice. I think that that's the solution, right? Um, I still think that Justice is a good back, but I think now having a guy like Keaton Mitchell means that you can have a healthy rotation of running backs. Gus is still going to be the guy. He had a huge, what, 50-yard run coming out of the second half yesterday. So he still got it. It ain't like, you know, you're not going to – Gus is going to get touches, and well-deservingly so. But I definitely think that Keaton Mitchell is the guy who has now made it an easy decision for the Ravens to find a way to make it a rotational thing more between him and Justice Hill. And that's good because it allows – all of the other running backs to not just have all of the workload. I know Gus said that he wanted all the workload and, you know, we laughed about that last week. Um, but ultimately he does have a, a history of injuries and you want to preserve him because this is a very long season and there's more games to be played. And then you have to uh, assume that the Ravens are going to make the playoffs. So J Gus has to be available. Well, you want Gus available through all of those situations. So I'm really happy uh, for Keaton Mitchell in terms of, uh, Odell, I'm happy for him too, man. You know, that's his first touchdown, I think, since the Super Bowl, which was, what, almost two years ago at this point. And so you can tell that the Ravens were pressing. I even made a joke on Twitter, like, does Tom Monkey know that this is not Lamar Jackson and this is Tyler Huntley? Because right. that whole series, they threw the ball. Yeah. They threw the ball the whole series. I mean, uh -huh. not the whole series. Um, after When they got into the, the red zone, they were throwing it. And I was like, hey, I'm confused. You know, uh, do we just not want to run the clock down and just run the ball? Like, what's going on? And then when you see Odell get the ball, it's like, okay, I understand now. I understand it was setting up for Odell to get his touchdown pass. And, and look, that could work wonders, Cordell, like for his confidence, for the Ravens' confidence in him. Um, so you hope that that is the beginning of more when it comes to what Odell has going on in terms of this defense. We can't say enough about it. And I really be, I, <laughs> I'm the person that does not want to speak highly about Mike McDonald and Tony Romo on the broadcast yesterday, you were at the game. So you didn't have an opportunity to really hear what was being said on the broadcast, but Jim Nance and Tony Romo, the number one CBS team was doing the game. And Tony Romo just had wonderful things to say about Mike McDonald to the point where he said, you know, he's going to be a head coach somewhere next year. Hey, 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 mm -hmm. hush, be quiet, okay? We here in Baltimore don't want to hear that. 
You know why? Because we love Mike McDonald here. I was a big advocate of Mike McDonald when Wink got fired and people was coming for me the first four weeks of the season when they were still trying to figure it out. But I ain't heard a peak since then. And as a matter of fact, a lot of y'all flipped the script. And look, it's understandable. Y'all, sometimes when you're familiar with something, you don't want change. But sometimes change is necessary. And in the case of Mike McDonald, I think that John Harbaugh understood what he had and had to let him get the opportunity. And Wink was in the way, essentially. Now, Wink also heard him himself in the sense of doing those cover zero blitzes with, with with guys that weren't really good. But ultimately, sometimes you have to make the sacrifice, Cordell, and say, I can't, I, I'm not comfortable with making this decision, but this is the best decision for my football team. And I think that that's what Harbaugh did in the case of Mike McDonald. And he has paid off wonderful dividends. They have shut down numerous high-powered offenses coming into the season. And while I hate the idea of he could potentially be gone, because it is a very realistic thing, it is something that he has absolutely earned. He will be getting looks. He deserves those looks. I'm just trying to find a way to um, make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure if I'm going to be successful. But ultimately, this this was one of the – we sit there and talk about the defensive players. We got to start talking about these coaches, man. They, they have been phenomenal. And Mike McDonald has been the anchor of what this defense has been able to do thus far. Yeah, I mean, they are the best defense in the league, in my opinion. Um, and I think it's for a variety of reasons. You mentioned the coaching, and it definitely got to start there because I talk uh, Mike McDonald up a lot about just how his scheme is player-proof. I mean, it just starts to feel like you can plug and play almost anybody in his defense and they'll look good. It just it yep. just seems like that's what's happening right now. Um, but you look at I was thinking about this earlier. Look at the Ravens player personnel on their defense. Look there. They have a type. The Ravens have a type. They like big physical unicorns types of players, players that can't just play one position you look at each level i think you have somebody that you can move around um you look on the defensive line obviously matter bk could play inside and out and standing in the locker room and interviewing matter bk after the game yesterday like you understand how big of a dude this is i mean my goodness he, he's he's a big dude and he can move and he's quick and he's strong I mean, it, it's just to 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 be a, to, to try to block him one on one. Good luck, good good luck. Um, <laughs> More power to you, including guys like Michael Pierce that is in the yeah. middle as well. But Jadavian Clowney, I mean, a freak of nature type of yes, um, and and, and like a predator type. Like uh, the dude could just go on the edge. He's an all, another one that you can put on the inside as well but you go to the second level and he gets kind of lost in the shuffle but Malik Harrison has been playing really good uh for them on the outside and it wasn't the case yes. last year when they put him on the outside it's been totally different from for him he's balked up he's gotten bigger and he's understood the he understands the principles of being an outside linebacker right now yep. so he's doing a really good job still in the edge doing a really good job tackling in space so he has he's opened up another layer of what they're able to do defensively Kyle Hamilton another one 64 long arms just got incredible reach he can run He's physical. He can cover anybody from wide receivers to tight ends to running backs. I mean, yep. to be able to have these types of chess pieces at your disposal defensively, I mean, I think any coach would be thrilled to have that. Um, but it's it's one thing to have it, and it's another thing to be able to know how to use it, to be able to um, put these guys in the best positions uh, that suit them. Because we've seen in the past, where guys are doing too much at times, you know, are, are yep. being asked to do too much and not necessarily asked to do the things that they do very well. Um, but you look at this Ravens team and I, I just see a defense that is just in sync. They're in rhythm and every it's, it just almost feels like muscle memory. Now you get to this point in the season, we're about to go into week 10. Um, and, and they're shutting people down the way that they're shutting them down. I mean, it's starting to just look like muscle memory. 
It's almost like yeah. they get on the field and they know they're not giving anything up. They're not giving anything up. And I don't think that's going to change. I honestly don't. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm looking at this schedule right now. And obviously they got the Browns coming in. And I mean, it's, it's the Browns defense is great, but I don't anticipate the Browns offense having much success against these guys either. The Bengals will yeah. be the test. The Bengals will be the real test, but they've had Joe Barrow's number in the past. Mike McDonald has. They yep. it, even when they put up points, it ain't the prettiest. It ain't the way that they want to do it. It ain't on the Bengals terms. It's more so on the Ravens terms if the Bengals have any success. So I'm curious to see how that works. Even the Chargers one, we'll see. That Chargers offense at home can can be dangerous. I think that may end up being their next real test defensively. Not to knock the Bengals. I think the Bengals will be a test, but they they just they just seem to have that offense's number um, right now. So I, I think they'll be okay against them. But I, I look at the Chargers one as the one that I'm like, okay, that's probably where they're going to really get tested more vertically than they have to any point um, uh, to this part in the season. But I, I definitely think that the defense is playing at an all-time high level, and it's the main reason why I look at the Ravens as a top three team in the NFL right now. I want to flip back to the offense because you said something early about the offensive line. And, um, yes, Ronnie Stanley isn't the Ronnie Stanley that we know. Um, I, there's been a lot of talk about him, his anchor not being there. And that's been concerning. And obviously the turnover, the the, the fumble, um, Ronnie Stanley gets beat really badly in that regard. So there is something to worry about. And also in the beginning of the game. Um, now, I know the field position wasn't the best. So there's that part of it, too. But they were definitely getting pushed back mm -hmm. on, uh, on that offensive line. Mm -hmm. But somehow, some way, they started to, you know, come to form. Tyler Lindenbaum, I, you know, this man... Stuff. Is playing a, a a phenomenal level, and it's funny because we're we're having conversations about Ronnie Stanley as we should. He's the left tackle that's gotten paid a lot of money, and and so that's a concern, obviously. But we got to start giving more flowers to Linda Ball, man. He has played so well, uh, and you know he's probably I, I don't know if there's four centers better than him in the National Football League. I'd say he's top five, but if you say that, you know, he, you would put him higher, again, I don't know that there may be four better guys than him playing right now. He is playing so well right now, and he, is, to me, at the moment, feels like he's the catalyst of what it is that this offense is doing, which says a lot about a guy who's only in his second year, and this, this offense is only going to be as good as that offensive line. Let's be clear on that. Like, I definitely think that um, how they play is a big part of what the Ravens are able to do because we know that Lamar doesn't really want to run the football. There were a couple of times where Lamar really could have taken off and ran, probably got a first down, and 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 chose not to. You know what I'm saying? He really wants to stay in the pocket, try to make the play out in the pocket, and so forth and so on. More, Morgan Moses didn't play, and then you have great backup players that are able to be capable of holding it down while their starters are out says a lot about not only um, the players, but the coaches and as well and the GM as well and how important trenches are to the Ravens that have always been. Um, and they, I, I really feel like that that's been an important part of what this offense has been able to do. And while Lamar to me is still trying to figure out the deep ball, he tried to throw a couple of passes to Rashad Bateman that, you know, weren't successful. We know um, I'm good with them still taking their shot. Mm -hmm. You got to you got to keep doing it until you figure it out. Until mm -hmm. you can connect, you still have to go ahead and try. You have to continue to try. I'm good. I'm completely good. Look, you can do that once a week as far as I'm concerned. Give Rashad Bateman more touches. He deserves it. Um he has definitely played well in the last few weeks, so I definitely think that he should have the opportunity to potentially go downfield and make some plays. And, and at some point you got to assume Cordell that one of those will connect. Um, and so that part is is really good. But just seeing how we talk about how complete this defense is and how like everybody steps up. And I think that they mentioned uh, on the, the broadcast, 13 different players have had sacks in that defense. But on the offensive side, to me, it's a it's a it's it's a group 
effort. It's a group project that essentially everybody, for the most part, is holding up their end of the bargain. And every week is going to be somebody different. You know, Zay is going to have a good game, and that's just going to what it's going to be. Or, you know, Nelson Aguilar is going to be the guy. When you look at Lamar's numbers, it's not like he, he did anything spectacular. You know, if you were a fantasy guy and you got him on his team, you're going to be like, oh, he only had 187 yards. He had no touchdowns. He also had no interceptions. But the way that the, the flow of the game allowed them to play was perfect for everybody coming up, contributing. That was a day that they said, we don't have to throw the ball all over the place. We're able to be successful with running the ball. We're going to let these these uh, touchdowns happen on the ground, and that's okay. And that's what I love about this offense is that one week, maybe they do step up and say, we got to do um, you know better when it comes to ca- passing. And then one week is they're like, hey, well, we're going to let this offensive on the ground do its job. And so when you're multifaceted and you're able to do that, to me, that's what gets you going in the long run and that's going to have you successful in the playoffs and potentially make a Super Bowl run that type of balance it to me is what's necessary in winning football games in the National Football League if you're not the Kansas City Chiefs because really they are an anomaly Mm -hmm. everybody else got to find a way to win football games and the Ravens to me had the perfect balance of doing just that and yesterday was a great example of that yeah, I mean, I, I want to echo that and really take it a step further. I think that this is the first time in Lamar's career where the Ravens aren't living and dying by Lamar Jackson. And, and that, to me, is why I think that this is the Ravens' best chance to win it all. Because you look at all the years in the past, and it's I've, I've just kept saying it's too much on Lamar's plate. He has mm-hmm. to do everything. He has to do everything. And now you just said it. In a game where he doesn't score, he doesn't He doesn't throw a touchdown. He doesn't rush for a touchdown. He doesn't have a bad game, but he doesn't have a great game. And yet they still go out there and they blow out the Seahawks by 34 points. They have the most complete team that they have had in the Lamar Jackson era to this Thanks. point. And, and it just is it, you're seeing how scary they can be. Now, imagine if you start get if, 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 if whenever Lamar does decide to have those games where he's just Superman, they're going to be unbeatable. They're going to be unbeatable right now. The Ravens have found the formula finally to be able to win games without Lamar Jackson having to be everything. And that's right. a lot because, yeah, you mentioned the Chiefs. Patrick Mahomes does have to do a lot for that team. What's underrated with them, though, is their defense is really good. You look at that game they just had against the Dolphins. I mean, it, the, off, the the Chiefs' offense wasn't great in the game. Mahomes did good, all things considered, especially considering Kelsey was really a no-show in that game. But you got to see how, how well-balanced they are, especially how good that defense is, given that Dolphins' offense, the problems they did. But everybody else, everybody else, you look at the you look at the Eagles. The Eagles have other guys. Yeah, Jalen Hurts does a lot in the running game as well. But DeAndre Swift is there. They have receivers that can make plays, so that Hurts doesn't have to run all, all around all over the place. Their defense can be legit. It's not as legit as it's been in the past, but it still can be uh, legit as well. I, I think you you look at um the Niners, same thing. God knows they don't lean on their quarterback as much as every other team. They're a well-balanced team. So I I just really think that's the thing that makes this season different for me. I've been hearing some whispers of 2019 um, because of how good this I I, I rebuke thee. I rebuke Cordell. Different team. I think I, I, I really, you look at 2019, yes, that was a team that as good as they were, Lamar Jackson was playing out of his mind all year. And the one game he doesn't, they look like how they look in the in the playoffs yep. in Tennessee. Yep. I think this year, this is a team that can handle Lamar not going out there and all and, and playing at an MVP level. They could still beat you and beat you bad uh just yep. because of how good they are. Um, all across the board. I also want to uh, mention you, you. You brought up Tyler Linderbaum. I, I still find it so funny that one of the knocks on him coming out of college was people thought he wasn't nasty enough. Like they just thought he wasn't gritty enough. He wasn't mean enough. He didn't fit the Ravens mantra. He was too much of a nice guy, the quiet guy. And I'm like, man, this dude is a, a lineman from Iowa. 
They don't you, you think they're just putting kicking out soft guys out there, dudes that aren't hunting uh blocks. It was a play yesterday, I think, on the Keaton Mitchell uh big run. That Tyler Linderbaum is look, I mean, he he blocks maybe three or four guys in the course of the play and is still looking for more people to block. And he's like 30 yards up the field. This is the center. Yep. Is moving. He doesn't get. Lamar said this a while back that Tyler Linderbaum may might be the fastest lineman he's ever played with, and that kind of got swept under the rug a little bit. Nobody really paid it any mind. But when you watch Tyler Linderbaum on film, you could think back also to last year that game against the Bucks where he's blocking guys up the field, where he's seeking guys on the third level. This is a yep. dude. That is constantly up the field on some of these big plays. I promise you, you watch some, especially a run. If you start watching some of these big runs that the Ravens have, if you look, I promise you, you'll see 64 somewhere up the field putting somebody on their butt because that's that's just the way he plays. But I, I do think that the Ravens right now are getting very scary. They're, they're, they're scary right now. You look at the league. Scary um, times in Baltimore. I mean, honestly, you you look at the league and you look at what the Ravens are doing, and I, I really don't I, I stand by I don't put much stock into the Seahawks. I, I just think that they're a defense. I think their defense can be legit, but offensively, Geno is not it. He's not playing like he was last year. Um yeah, they're he has regressed a little bit, yeah. All the way that they were able to last year. That that offense is just very hot and cold and more cold than hot. Um, but I, I still look at the fact that this is a team that's tough to blow out and they're tough to beat uh, on the road, even though they're coming West Coast to East Coast. You look at it historically, Pete Carroll's teams do very good when they travel to the East Coast and they play in a one o'clock game. I know some of that stuff may may not mean much to a lot of people, and usually it doesn't to me, but it's a nice sample size to kind of make you wonder about how good that team is when they're in that time slot on the East coast. But I, I, I think that this Ravens team right now, I just think the defense is a well oiled machine and I just don't really see many chinks in that armor. And while the offense could still get better, they still struggle with consistency. I just think that they're good enough to be able to beat whoever they play. Yeah. I'm with you on that. So with that being said, let's give out some pats on the hat. I'll let you start first. I know it's going to be, you know, who we, who we all believe it should be. Who's your first panel? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm go with the undrafted guy. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go with Keaton Mitchell. Um, Keaton Mitchell coming out making his debut. Well, not his debut. He's played before, but he, he this is he, this was his coming out party. Um, for for sure for Keaton Mitchell. I mean, you can't ask so much more from the undrafted rookie. Nine carries, 138 yards, and a touchdown. I mean, he's really the one that blew that game open. Once he came yep. in. And he's getting those big runs that he's getting. It's it's deflating. It's deflating for a team. I mean, who is this guy, first off? Um, and then he just comes in and he's running circles around the defense. I mean, what are you what are you gonna do? You're already getting your butt kicked, and now you got a guy that you've never even heard of coming in and running up and down your defense. That right there is just telling you it's time to go home. So Keaton Mitchell, uh, for me, gets a pat on the hat. Absolutely. Of course, I'm going to flip it to the defensive side and give it to our guy, Geno Stone. Yet another interception leading the league in interceptions. He has done a phenomenal job. Um, it is really exciting to see Geno just playing and having fun and also being as productive as he's been this season. So um, exciting for him. I'm really happy uh, for him to uh, pass is deflected as well. Uh, so shout out to Gino for just con continuing to play at a high level right now. Who else you got? Yeah, um, I'm going to go back to the offense and I'm going to go with Mark Andrews. Nine catches, season high, nine catches on the day, 80 yards. And it's not even necessarily about the stats, it's more the impact. I mean, he was Lamar's guy on third downs. And I remember it was a third and forever, maybe third and 21, third and 27 or something. And Mark Andrews gets a big catch and run to get them into a fourth and one situation that they end up going for and converting and would ultimately end up scoring on the drive. Mark Andrews is really the guy. I mean, he's still the guy in this offense. He's still old faithful. Um, whenever Lamar needs a play, whenever this offense needs a play, 
89 is right there for them every single time. As we're talking about this offense still searching for consistency, Mark Andrews is still the most consistent player they have on that side of the ball. Absolutely, and continue to feed him because uh, there's really nothing. Mark Andrews is so good at what he does, Cordell. Like, you know, he has a lot of free reign, and it's because he has the opportunity to see the field, and Lamar sees it the same way, and he can find the soft spots in the zones. And so, you know, if, if Mark is open, I'm not suggesting just throw it to Mark because you got other guys. But if you want to buy, Mark Andrews more than likely is there to, to, to get you out of it. So uh, shout out to Mark. I'm going to stay on the defensive side of the ball. I'm going to give Kyle Van Noy uh, mm -hmm. a pat on the head. This man continues to amaze me. I mean, he literally was at home eating Cheetos. I don't know. It might have been some Doritos. Maybe it was something healthy. I don't know. Maybe he was eating some caramel rice cakes because, you know, he had to stay in shape. <laughs> Me, somebody was going to call him and give him a job. And the Ravens were the ones to do it. And he has been on a tear since he's been signed. This is one of the more underrated signings in the Eric DaCosta era that we should have more conversations about. He comes in yesterday, two more sacks mm -hmm. uh, for yesterday, 21 yards total loss in those two sacks and he has just been phenomenal this has been a, a fantastic signing uh by the ravens so kyle van noy gets multiple pats on the hat for me and i feel like this won't be the last one him and Clowney, you know since they've been here have just been great for what this defense has been able to do and uh it's just been really fun to watch him come off the street and just be as dominant as he's been so kyle gets mine what's what's your last one yeah i'm gonna stay on i'm gonna get on the defensive side as well i'm gonna go to justin matter bk uh matter bk four tackles gets another sack uh, sets the franchise record for most consecutive games with at least a half sack in a game for Matabike. So continuing to outprice himself, continuing to show how dominant he can be, how how dominant he can be on the interior of that defensive line. He's just such a force. Um, he plays with such energy right now. I, I I'm just so happy to see uh, Matabike finally start to come into his own because I. I got to be honest, for a while, I was wondering if it was going to happen. I really was. I was wondering if it was going to happen. I mean, he's got, the, he's always had the body frame and the ability to do it, but it just was yep. not coming together for him on the field. And so I just didn't know if this version of him would ever show up, but it is here and it looks like it's here to stay at least for this year. Um, so I'm curious to see what happens in the off season with him, but right for right now, he's still a Raven and he is balling. Balling, okay. Uh, last pat on the head. I'm going to actually give it to Lamar Jackson. Now, I know that statistically he did not have the game that you would think that he deserves a pat on the hat, understandably so. Um, uh, but 60 yards on the ground. This is a set from CB, uh, excuse me, NFL on CBS this morning that I saw. Lamar Jackson leads quarterbacks and completion percentage currently at 71.5% and rush yards, which is at 440 this season. The only quarterback to do that in a single season since the merger was Steve Young in 1994. And so Lamar has just been on a different level this year. I mean, and this is with him not even trying to run the football like that anymore, Cordell. He is definitely trying his best to stay in the pocket. And thank you for reminding me, uh, Spencer, our producer, remind me, 49ers actually won the Super Bowl that same year um, that he had that record. So uh, while we're not going, we're not going to jinx it, you know, we're not going to jinx it yet. But ultimately, that is something to be said about how great Lamar has played because Steve Young obviously is a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. Steve Young is a guy that had a lot of success in this league in passing and in rushing. And Lamar has been able to do that as a passer. He's also been able to do that as a runner. And I can't speak enough about how great Lamar has played. And, and there, there were times yesterday when things just, you know, it wasn't open for him. Guys weren't getting open and he made a play with his legs. Or again, like you mentioned, you know, Mark Andrews, finding Mark Andrews when he was trying to get out of a bind, he was able to do that. So to see him only had five incompletions yesterday. Uh -huh. I mean, to see him play at the level that he is playing, it just feels like he is focused. Not that he was never unfocused. I want to be clear, but All this right. is different. It feels different. 
what Lamar's doing now feels different. And I definitely think it should be recognized, even though the statistics won't say, oh, he had a phenomenal game yesterday. But he did. He did have a phenomenal game yesterday because the way that he managed that game yesterday against a really good football team says a lot about what Lamar has been able to do thus far. So it's been great to watch him just continue to ascend and be this great quarterback that many of us knew that he was able to be. And I and and, and I want to say I usually don't do this. I, I I'm not going to call anybody out by name, but I'm just <laughs> seeing some stuff on social media. Um, from because Lamar did have a little injury himself in the game. Um, he did. It yeah. Doesn't look like it's anything serious. It looked like he may have tweaked tweaked his ankle on one of the plays where he got tackled and kind of wrapped around. Um, but I'm. I, I don't really say anything, but some of these Twitter doctors and stuff that be doing their own self-diagnosis and stuff, it, it, it's, it's kind of killing me right now because I'm seeing people um, put out that he, that Harbs even went up to the podium and said Lamar had a tweak of his knee. That's not what Harbs said. He never said anything like that. In fact, Lamar's knee isn't even a thing that got hurt, at least to our knowledge. It was his ankle that 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 got nicked up in the game and he was okay that, yeah, they ended up taking him out, but the game was already well in hand. Right, by that right. Point. Um, so, and he stayed in to finish that drive. I saw Lamar walking in the locker room. He seemed fine after that. So I, I wouldn't overly stress that, but I'm, I'm seeing some of those Twitter doctors trying to stir some uh, chaos up with that Lamar injury. And I'm not trying to go down the Lamar injury uh, tunnel again. I'm, I've had enough of that after the last couple of years. So I just wanted to nix that because I, I saw that kind of starting to take off a little bit. Uh, yeah. It, it, you know, he seemed fine. Both Lamar and uh, Harb said, you know, appeared that they was fine. Even the Ravens, you know, used the video this uh, on Monday saying victory Monday with him jumping up and down at the, the Odell um, touchdown. So, you know, hopefully um, it continues to be that it's no problem, but I agree with you. Stop. I understand it's the, the, the second part of the season, so you're watching very closely, but enough. We've seen enough of this, so stop this. Uh, I want to talk on our next episode, Cordell. I want us to talk about, you mentioned the 2019 team and about the comparisons to now. Let's talk more about that on our next episode. I want to talk about why that's a bad idea and why we should bury the 2019 team mm -hmm. at this point. Um, but I, that will be a fun conversation to have, I think, um, because I did see a lot of conversation in social media land talking about that 2019 team. And I think that that's a that's a fun conversation, but also one that we just have to move on from in terms of that team. We got to move on from the 2019 season, y'all. I'm sorry. I, I'm going to be the bearer of bad news. I think it's time to do it. And now is the time to do it. And I want us to talk about that on our next episode. So when we come back on our next episode, we'll talk about that and some other things. We'll talk about some other things as well. Um, but we want to thank you all for listening. We appreciate your support. So from Cordell to me, this is Winning Drive.